friends who have joined from around the world uh, to mark International Women's Day, the International Peace Bureau um, Asia team organizing this webinar today on gender and disarmament. A warm welcome. I greet you all in my indigenous language, Mayambu Taramna Okjeri. Uh, this is an event which is a part of the International Peace Bureau World Congress to be held in Barcelona also in October 2021. So uh, we are really happy that the focus today is on gender and disarmament. And we have a, a eminent speakers who are joining in from Japan, from South Korea and from Guam. And also from Italy, our International Peace Bureau co-president Lisa Clark. Uh, why gender and disarmament? Even today as the world COVID deaths have reached more than 2 million and more than 96 million people are going into poverty because of this COVID, more than half of those who are going into poverty are women and young girls. The gendered impact of what's happening around the world is so real that you know, we have more than $1.9 trillion spent every year on, on international arms trade and all of that. And uh, the amount of budget for looking at the gen their gender Im impact and gender justice is the price of one fighter jet of $111 million only. The amount of $1.9 trillion spent last year on the military industry by nations around the world, if that money can help, it will fund the U United Nations UN Women budget for more than 6,000 years. So this is the skewed nature of how the militarized world is failing to respond to gender justice, failing to protect our women, our children, people of minorities, the indigenous around the world. So today's meeting will focus on those dimensions. And so we have with us, um, first our, uh, we'll have Lisa Clark, uh, who is the co-president of International Peace Bureau. She's an active member of the Blessed Are the Peacemakers. Lisa lives in, lived in Sarajevo, which was under siege uh, in the 1990s. And she worked towards fostering networks of solidarity amongst the inhabitants of the city and across the front line. She has participated and supported nonviolent groups. And she has also taken part and leadership role in election monitoring missions in Palestine, Albania, Chiapas, and coordinated the civil society monitoring mission for the first democratic elections in DRC in the 2016. Lisa's activism has concentrated on nuclear disarmament campaign in Italy and within the Italian disarmament network. Uh, my apologies, that was my alarm. <laughs> I'll just see, yeah. Our, the, uh, the other speakers that we are going to have today are Hirano Emiko, Hirano Emiko. She's the international section chief of the new Japan Women's Association, Emiko joined the anti-nuclear peace movement when she took part in the World Conference against atomic and hydrogen bombs in 1984 for the first time as an international secretariat staff member. Struck and deeply touched by the Hibakusha's testimony, she committed herself to working for the elimination of nuclear weapons by making the best use of her language skill. Um, the, uh, so she has a work to promote women's rights in Japan with children to build solidarity with women also around the world. Emiko takes charge uh, and has taken part in many United Nations meetings and also at the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Our second speaker is Lisa Linda Nati uh, Vidad, which is from the Guan Coalition for Peace and Justice. And she is also the professor of social work at the University of Guam. Lisa Linda is also the primary convener of the Guan Coalition and a founding member of Juan Hagen uh, Famala Guan. I think, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. She's an indigenous Chamaru who has championed the exposure of human rights violations against her people and homeland in Guam, which is a military colony of the United States. She, Lisa has spoken globally on the topics of demilitarization, decolonization, and the critical role that women play in safe and thriving communities. Um, you know, the, all the uh, bios of our speakers are on the site that we had shared. 
Our third and final speaker is Jungmin Choi, who is the coordinator of nonviolence training at the World Without War, a South Korean anti-militarist organization based in Seoul, South Korea, that supports conscientious objectors and takes action against the arms trade. She has worked on migrant women program at Duribang, a women's organization in Gujichon in, in around the year 2012 and 18. So these are our really uh, eminent panel of speakers. It's very rare to have such extraordinary group of women from the Asia Pacific region who are speaking on gender and disarmament. This is our way of decolonizing disarmament. So thank you with this. I'm going to hand over to Sean, Sean from the International Peace Bureau, Berlin office to have a little bit of a technical uh, you know, sharing with all of you. And then we will screen a short uh, you know, a video called uh, A World Without Rimpac, which is the world's largest uh, you know, naval exercise and how uh, indigenous people through their poetry are expressing their uh, you know, uh, resistance against militarization. Thank you and Sean. All right, hello, and thank you everyone for being with us today. Just a few quick technical points. Uh, first, while uh, the speakers are speaking, please keep your microphone muted um, and off. If uh, you have questions throughout the presentations, you can ask them in the chat box, um, or also use the raise hand feature, which you can find on the bottom of the screen in the reactions column. Uh, if you have troubles with that, please send us a chat and we will make sure to address your question uh, during the question and answer section. Uh, the event today is being live streamed on our Facebook page. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable having your face shown, please keep your camera off, although we are generally going to be keeping the spotlight on our speakers for the conversation today. Uh, we've also posted the link to the live stream in the chat, so feel free to share that if you'd like to share the event today with others uh, within your network. Thank you. This I request uh, uh, you know, that video title cancel rim back by 13 indigenous, indigenous points. It's... In a world without rim pack. Papa will bear down smiling through the pain of birth, no longer afraid of losing her child to bombs. She will breathe, and we will breathe. Yeah. In a world without Rimpak, there is breath enough to stand against the torpedoing teeth, the amphibious assaults, underwater explosions, the nuclear bombs, and billions of dollars and bullets of peacetime that continue elsewhere. Breath enough to solve these and so many wounds, to sing so loud we drown all submarine sonar. In a world without war games on our watery blue body, there is no place for hungry egos, no place for triggering weapons into the belly of the rich, vast, blue Moana, because she will breathe free, freely, freedom, chanting, my body is not your playground. In a world without militarization, words like colonization and occupation become words used in the past tense. What possibilities emerge when we are free? Islands as space for creative growth and true security. The entire Pacific Ocean unafraid to breathe. In a world without nuclear warfare, Tahitian, Marshallese, Hawaiian, indigenous lives would be celebrated without hierarchy based on dollars and euros, without fear for our smallness or isolation, needing the protection of empire, unfurling a pandemic of radiation, contamination, and sickness. All lives would be created equal. In a world without deception, no one believes that security is a function of bullets. In a world without naval sonar, a song returns from a vast assembly of cerulean gods to an altar of coral and island anchored to this blue chorus from the depths of obscurity, kanaloa'uhe'e, a tubulous melee from which we all do our living. The source is stable, Ola. In a world 
child without war, no child will bear a ballistic horizon. Only clouds, skies, waves will thunder. In a world without appropriation, our language will be unstolen. Te mana, te kaha, rest from the crest of Her Majesty New Zealand ships of war. In a world without naval frigates, Eva traverses the Royal Mwananui, the Star Command Blue Sky merging into the Navy Blue Pacific. Kiwa fishes for islands across the ultramarine, hauling up Hawaii necessary respite. In a world without war, we wouldn't have to wonder if we'd wake to bombs being dropped on our villages, or question if our hanam was clean enough to drink, our golai safe enough to eat. No trespassing signs and fence lines wouldn't dictate the journeys of our tanu and our tasi. We'd be islanders connecting through constellations and canoes, sitting under coconut trees, sharing origin stories, chewing kuku, round bodies dancing, islander hearts beating, ancestral dreams come true. In a world without bombs, we honor generations of Ike. We seed forests of koa. We stand in the malu of our sacred mountains, plant our ieve in the frigid waters. We stare back at Aina and see our reflections, kneel down and are fed. In a world without bombs, we rise from the sea they tried to conquer. Ea, maike kai mai. In a world without militancy, silk breaths line her womb. Finally, she can breathe. Yes, we all can breathe together in a world without bring back, a world without more wars. With this, I call upon Lisa Clark, co-president of the International Peace Bureau to give her opening remarks, Lisa. Thank you, Vina. Thank you all of you who worked so hard to organize this. This is a fantastic experience. I'm moved and a little bit speechless after that video canceled RIMPAC. Imagine I didn't know what RIMPAC was, but I checked it up earlier. Um, I wanted to say that there is something historical about the topic that we are about to address today, although we, we are going to be correctly, I think, uh, for our time and age, uh, addressing it from an Asian point of view, because it's the Asian working group of IPB that is addressing this. This is a novelty for IPB, uh, and I'm very excited about that. But the entire topic is part of the origins, the foundations of the IPB. Not more than a year and a half ago, there was a conference in Prague celebrating the 130th anniversary of the publication of the book by Bertha von Suttner called, in English it was called Lay Down Your Arms. There was a later English translation, a more modern English translation, which was called simply Disarm, with a big exclamation mark at the end. Now, Berta von Suttner, who was she? Well, she was one of the founders of the International Peace Bureau in the 1890s. And her, she was a woman. Uh, she had been part of the um, International Alliance of Women at the time. She was one of the speakers at the uh, Berlin conference. Oops, excuse me, I did the same thing that uh, Bina did earlier and didn't turn my phone off. Um, uh, she was in one of the 1904 Berlin International Conference speakers where most of the women were speaking about suffrage. They were suffragists. Uh, and she spoke about peace and disarmament. She was the person who in the 1890s decided that it was necessary for the peace movement to have an office, a bureau, that would be a permanent structure where the women, and also the men, uh, from all over the countries uh, in, in Europe at that time, Europe and North America for the most part, 
but her idea was that it should be international. So that is how the International Peace Bureau was founded. And uh, she is also credited with being the person who uh, told her friend Alfred Nobel that after having endowed all those other prizes for chemistry and medicine and so on, he must endow a prize for peacemaking. And in fact, he, she told him it should be the Nobel, Peace, the Nobel Prize for Peace and Disarmament. That the word disarmament has been sort of slightly lost, uh, but not the concept. So I think that this is a very timely, this uh, uh, webinar that we're having, absolutely important. Um, the history of the IPB is based on that. But um, my personal history, which I'd like to touch on for a second, after Vina introduced me and mentioned that I lived in Sarajevo, that uh, I also spent time in Chiapas, uh, in Mexico, amidst the, the people who were building their own autonomous alternative communities. It's the communities, I think, that we will also be hearing from our speakers uh, later in, in, in a few minutes during this webinar. It's the same kind of story of how you organize and encourage and lead your communities in a vision of nonviolence uh, and against the violence of war. Well, in my experience there and in Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, I must say that it was the women who were organizing always much more actively than any of the men. There is something to do with in all cultures, in all civilizations, there is something to do with women's role. I'm not talking about biological affairs. I'm talking about intellect and heart. Uh, there is, women feel it upon themselves, the task of protecting the future of the community. And therefore you protect the lives of everyone in your community and you work towards an inclusive future. I remember being asked frequently, you know, what is the role of women uh, in opposing war? That is a very interesting question and we will be hearing our speakers telling us about that. But what I'm never asked, but I think is extremely important is what happens after the violence of a war. Um, in many cases, women lose the struggle to keep their communities free of violence and free of war. And in that case, the war devastates. I was in, as, I, as you read earlier, Vina, I was in Sarajevo for several years during the bombing and the campaign and the destruction. Well, my answer is we should look at what women allow us to do after the end of war. It's only thanks to women, in my experience, that there is still something to reconstruct after the violence of a war. They will have, they keep alive a sense of community for the future. And that is, I think, uh, even when we lose our struggle against violence, against militarism, against war, even when we lose it during the violent moments, we women allow the community to have a foundation from which to reconstruct, to start all over again. Thank you all. I'm really looking forward to listening to you all. Yes, thank you so much, Aliza, for your inspiring words. Absolutely. The, um, work of Bertha von Suttner and her book, Lay Down Your Arms, was uh, indeed inspired many, many people around the world. And International Peace Bureau, which is sponsoring uh, this particular meeting, is the world's oldest peace organization, as we lucidly heard that it was the work of uh, really extraordinary women leaders at the time, like Bertha, who made this happen. So thank you for bringing the historical in, uh, you know, narrative. And also for, uh, it was the women actually in my home region of Manipur who came as early as 1904 during the Women's War of 1904. And then in 1915, for the first time on 28th of April, 1,200 women came together for the International Congress of Women. 
uh, to protest the, the, the World War at the time at The Hague in Holland. And this year we are going to have again, as I said, an International Peace Congress. So I'm really glad that we are part of a team in the world and it is growing, uh, which is International Peace Bureau is able to bring that culture of peace and women led culture of peace, gendered uh, way of peace to this world and our consciousness. Uh, with this, I'm going to call upon uh, our first speaker, uh, Hirano Emiko, International Section Chief of New Japan Women's no uh, Association, to deliver her remarks. You are muted. So, so sorry about that. Uh, my name is Emiko, and thank you for the kind. Uh, introduction to introduction of myself and thank you uh, my IPB sisters and brothers for uh, organizing this wonderful event uh, to mark the International Women's Day. Uh, okay. And I, I, I am so happy uh, to see Lisa Linda, my uh, Gohan sister again. <laughs> and I, I'm also happy uh, that my Korean sister uh, joining this event because we are um, we have very much in common and we are in a, a common struggle against militarization. Uh, just briefly, uh, my country, Japan, uh, is well known uh, for, for its peace constitution, which renounces the war forever. However, uh, Japan is also a strong, strong ally with the United States, and it, it stays under the nuclear umbrella of the United States. And in this country, uh, we, women of Japan, are, um, are working day and day, day and night for peace and against nuclear, dis uh, not disarmament, nuclear <laughs> weapons and militarization. And, and one, one more thing is that Japan hosts one, more than 130 uh, U.S. military bases in Japan, including in our capital city, Tokyo. So it's a very um, complicated country. Uh, anyway, uh, let me start with the my presentation. Okay. Oh. Can you see? Oh, not yet. I have to <laughs> do this. Yes, we can see it now. No, not this one. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> again, uh, let me try again. Okay. Not, not this one. <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm getting nervous. Okay, where am I? Can you see? Can you see my PowerPoint? Not yet. Uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, don't worry. You you. Take your time, don't worry. Okay, this one. Can you see now? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, I want to speak about women's vision, voice and activism making a difference uh, to make, uh, to achieve a nuclear free, peaceful, just and sustainable future. And, and maybe would you like to make it full screen? Do you okay. know how? Yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, uh -oh. You, uh, 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 no, 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 uh, no, 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 there yet. is a section which looks like a tub, uh, which is, okay, uh, no, 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 it's down, 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 no, 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 at the end, <laughs> at the end, you have this, which looks like a tub, like this, Oh, we should have practiced. Like, oh, I didn't get, I don't get it, maybe. Get the cursor down where you see where your point is. After this uh, four uh, boxes, there's one which has a, like a tub. This? No. Okay, don't worry. You just, you, you just, uh, I think. Okay, okay. Slide show, maybe. Slide show, slide show. Yeah. Slide show. Slide show. I, I do it. This is okay now. It's okay. 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 <laughs> Sorry for the mess. So let me start. Uh, so 
just briefly, um, my, my organization, New Japan Women's Association, was founded in 1962. And in that year, in around that time, around the time of Japan uh, trying to uh, trying to sign the security treaty with the United States, which is the base basis for establishing Japan-US military alliance. And so uh, our uh, my organization was born out of the uh, strong wish of women for peace and against militarization of Japan. And we have about 130,000 members all around, all around Japan. And uh, we have one national office and I work uh, full time in that office. Okay. And we have, uh, my association is uh, called Shinfujin for short in Japanese. And Shinfujin has five objectives and which is here, which are here. And uh, as you can see, we are the women's, uh, organ women's organization working for, for peace at the same time for women's rights uh, and solidarity of women all around, all around the country, all around the world. And so these are, two, these are the two of our founders. Now, I would like to, uh, in my presentation, I would like to focus on what we do uh, at, on the ground for the elimination of nuclear weapons, although we uh, work for, for all the issues related with peace, such as uh, against uh, military um, present, presence in Japan and, and also military exercises and so on. But I would like to uh, focus uh, my presentation on the nuclear abolition. And I want to celebrate with you uh, that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, uh, TPNW, was entered into force on January, January 22nd this year. And uh, these are the pictures of UN headquarters in New York, lighted up with a message, uh, now illegal, nuclear weapons always immoral, and now illegal. So uh, no country uh, is allowed to possess nuclear weapons anymore. And uh, I would like to also mention that Philipp the Philippines was the latest country to uh, ratify as the 54th country. And there will be more and more countries uh, becoming party to the treaty. And on that day, January the 22nd, uh, we have many, many celebratory actions all over Japan. And this is a photo of the uh, one of such events, uh, such action events, uh, which was held in Tokyo. And uh, you, can you, you can see several people uh, with the banner on their bodies, and they they are Hibakusha, the survivors of the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, together with them, uh, we celebrated the entry into force of the treaty. And also, we urged, urged, urged Japan, the Japanese government, to become party to the treaty because Japan uh, has uh, continues to uh, to oppose oppose this uh, oppose the TPNW. Although it it although Japan is the only country that was uh, attacked by uh, attacked with by the nuclear atomic bombs. So our focus, uh, our work, our focus is now to get uh, the Jap Japanese government to sign and ratify the treaty. And uh, my association members all over Japan were so happy uh, saying that we made this treaty because uh, we've been working uh, ever since we were our association was founded. We've been working for abolition of the nuclear weapons, and uh, so we we uh, are aware that our movement in solidarity with the Hibakusha have brought TP and W into life. So th these are the photos of uh, celebratory uh, actions, and also uh, we are calling on the Japanese government to become party to the treaty 
in a, in all the all these kinds of actions. You know, it, uh, it, from north to south. So even in the snow, uh, our members were on the street to celebrate the entry into force of the treaty. And uh, so why we say that we made uh, the treat, we made this treaty is that we've been uh, calling on a, we, on the international community to uh, have have a international agreement to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. So uh, and one of our, our activities uh, is the signature collecting because we believe that one everyone see all everyone signature represent the uh, the will of each person uh, to get uh, nuclear weapons uh, eliminated. So we have presented 106 oh, oh no uh, 16 million okay 16 million five hundred seventy thousand signatures uh, to UN United Nations calling for the elimination of nuclear weapon, weapons. And these are the photos for, uh, for photos of the old time and the recent years that we, uh, these are the boxes of signatures. Uh, and this is the picture uh, that I took at the UN, UN, uh, UN General Assembly Hall. And it, uh, it, this is the, this, uh, Pile of these are the pile, piles, piles of signatures uh, from Japan and other countries also uh, calling on uh, member states to work for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And this display is not there anymore, but, um, but this this is how uh, the United uh, this is how this is the way we. Uh, press the member states, the governments of all over all over the world to work for the elimination of nuclear weapons. And so these are the street uh, campaign uh, signature drive for uh, calling for the for the public, calling on the public to support the elimination of nuclear weapons. And uh, along with the signature collecting, we do grassroots grassroots activities and one of them is the uh, activities activity to make the facts of the atomic bombs known widely and across generations so we involve children uh, in this activity also and and oh and this oh sorry <laughs> okay how we I can get back to the okay okay okay, okay. oh, oh. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And uh, this is the uh, picture of the cover of the book called Burn Like a Fallen Leaves. And this is the pub publication uh, done by the uh, Hiroshima chapter of New Japan Women's Association. And the Hiroshima chapter uh, publishes every year the collection of the Hibakusha stories. Uh, so they are collecting all those stories from the Hibakushas uh, around in, in, in their communities and, and edited, edit, edit all the stories into one book and publish every year. And also, we promote solidarity of women around the world with the help of the Women's Peace Fund. Women's Peace Fund is uh, give a, uh, gives us the money to assist the uh, participation of women activists uh, from different countries in the World Conference Against uh, Atomic and Hydrogen Bombs, which is annually held uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And Lisa was uh, one of the guests uh, invited to the uh, World Conference Against ANH Bombs in 2011. Here is Elisa. So uh, what I would like to say is that it is now 100 seconds to midnight. The, 
uh, it, this is the clock, um, doomsday clock, uh, and the uh, and the atomic bulletin of the atomic scientists every year up, updates uh, the clock. And last year it was announced that we are uh, 100 seconds. We have only 100 seconds to midnight. Midnight midnight means the end of the humanity. And why? And the reason why we are so uh, in a dangerous situation is that the, we have the existential threats, which are nuclear weapons and climate, cli climate crisis. And now uh, we, we have COVID-19 pandemic uh, added to this, these exi existential threats. So we don't have uh, money uh, to, we have no more money to spend or time to spend for military, military, militarization, as Bina said in her opening remarks. So uh, we are still, uh, we still find many countries, including, including Japan, uh, spending so much money on weapons and, and weapons and military, military facilities, but we need to, uh, if we need to uh, survive, and if we, if we want to, want our planet to survive, we have to change discourse and um, way, of the, way of using money now. And for that, I think we, I, I think we, all, we all agree agree that we need women in uh, decision making. And uh, the, so uh, finally, I would like to say that uh, we, as all, as every, as we all know that we are we women are still under un underrepresented in decision making positions but on the on the ground women are now uh, we don't women are mobilizing themselves organizing themselves and say standing up saying no to the sexual uh, harassment or, or sexual violence and militarization, and we are saying no to the way of the money being used in, in weapons, and and the, we never we will we continue to say no to discrimination and gender violence. So these are the pictures in Japan. Uh, we have uh, uh, may, we have many uh, regularly organized uh, demonstrations on the streets and we call it flower demonstrations and women get together uh, with the survivors or surviving victims of sexual violence. And we uh, hear the, their stories and to, uh, to uh, rec and to, we hear the stories of women and then we continue to uh, organize actions uh, with them. So, uh, and finally, just to add to that, uh, I, I, I said that women are still underrepresented, but uh, we have more and more, especially younger uh, women uh, diplomats and activists as well, working uh, actively. For example, the, at the UN, conference to negotiate a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, which is the uh, TPNW. Uh, the, this one, it was the uh, uh, chair, chair of the uh, chair of the conference was women diplomat from uh, Costa Rica. And now we have a uh, UN under UN under Secretary General, uh, whose name is Nakamitsu Izumi, Japan, the first Japanese wo wo woman to take up that post. And uh, she, is, she is also, she, is, she works as the uh, UN representative uh, for, for disarmament affairs. And we saw, I saw, I was there and I saw many, many young diplomats um, engaging, engaged in the negotiations to uh, adopt a treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons. So, and also uh, this is the one who is speaking is the, the then 
president, president of New Japan Women's Association addressing to the conference. So we, we hope that uh, women are not only uh, working on the ground for peace, but we are, um, we are now become, we are now empowering, uh, empowering ourselves to uh, take up the uh, huge responsibilities uh, in a political field as well. So we have to be, we have to push uh, and organize ourselves so that we can achieve 50-50 uh, future uh, women with women and men and people of all the, the all the different uh, sexual identity, gender, sexual and gender ident identities uh, sharing the, uh, sharing, uh, sharing, working together uh, equally. So happy International Women's Day. Thank you so much, um, uh, Emiko, for this excellent presentation. We have IPB board member Reiko also with us here. The work done by the women of Japan has been deeply, deeply inspiring. And the takeaway from your presentation today is the power that, that women and people have and what the Japanese civil society has really shown in terms of getting 140 million signatures to really now that nuclear weapons are now banned on the face of the world. Nuclear weapons are banned from the base, face of the world, thanks to the extraordinary work of each and every one of you there. So our congratulations once again. The, that other takeaway is the fact that you talked about how it, 54 collections of Hibakusha stories, stories of uh, you know, uh, nuclear weapons uh, survivors. I think the takeaway today as we formulate an Asia-Pacific Women's Declaration on, on peace and demilitarization is we will get to get the disarmament stories out to the world so that our children and intergeneration can learn from it. And finally, to continue that women are a part of decision-making to make the world uh, to demilitarize and in the process of disarmament, which is much needed. So thank you so much for, for your presentation. I now go to uh, you know, Lisa Linda Nati Vitad, the Guhan Coalition for Peace and Justice. Uh, she's also a professor of social work at the University of Guam. Again, the, 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 the indigenous lands are heavily militarized, weaponized, and Lisa Linda's presentation will drive home this particular point. Lisa, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bina, for the introduction. And it is such a beautiful opportunity for us as women to share this space. Um, and it's so comforting to see familiar faces um, of co-presenters and others who we've worked with uh, in the context of the peace movement throughout the world, because um, clearly women connect the entire globe. And so um, I just share a couple of my organizational affiliations here uh, on this slide, but we'll be speaking primarily from the context of Ihagan from Malawan Guahan. Um, and Ihagan from Malawan Guahan is a recently incorporated indigenous Chamorro Women's Association of Guahan. And so Guahan is our native name for our land, um, more popularly known to the world as Guam. And we are a current modern day US colony and technically called an unincorporated territory of the United States that's heavily heavily militarized. And so our organization uh, was incorporated with the intent of promoting the well-being of Chamorro women, girls, and gender diverse persons uh, living within our community. Um, and part of our incorporation was very clear to provide a conduit for women's political voice to be able to be elevated, to have a seat at the table, which is very consistent with our traditional matrilineal uh, um, role in our traditional society as Chamorro women in the Pacific. And so Ihegan from Malawan Guahan honors the Chamorro woman of Guahan as our link to our Mangafa and our Mangafa is our family as well as the predecessors of all of our mothers, Inan and Mami. And so for those of you who we've uh, interacted with in the past, you'll see some familiar faces here in this picture, in particular our Saina, which is uh, our word for our elder, 
uh, Miss Hope Christobel. Uh, she's now, she just celebrated her 75th year birthday. And so she really has been our leader, um, is our Maga Haga, our female chief in terms of our work. Uh, she's visited the United Nations in excess of 20 years uh, successively to um, elevate the concern of our island's colonization. Because with us, militarization, nuclearization is very much intertwined with our colonial relationship with the United States, which is clearly unilateral and exploitative from the United States towards our people. And so as women, we are sustained by the kana or the spirit force force of our ancestors and our sacred connection to our lands and waters. And it's this sacred connection that we work so hard to protect and which centers our work in terms of demilitarization and denuclearization and really working towards a greater peace um, and reframing what security looks like. Uh, the International Network of Women Against Militarism has coined the term genuine security and the concept of genuine security transcends concepts of national security to focus more so with what is consistent with the United Nations definition of human security and focusing on what our communities need to be to truly be safe and to thrive inclusive of safe environments with clean water with an environment that sustains life and not the opposite as in the case of militarization. And so we in the Pacific, um, our location on the one hand has become very romanticized and exoticized to the rest of the world, uh, but we clearly are where the East meets the West. So on the one hand, um, this may be seen as a blessing, but on another, it really, in terms of a militarist view is our greatest curse. Um, my island of Guahan here, as you can see, is the central converging point for many different triangles of military activities of the United States military and its apparatus. And so to the right of, of this map, you see Hawaii, which is the, where native Kanaka Maoli, the homeland. And so earlier, as we began this presentation or this event, um, for us, it's night. I'm not sure what time, and I think it's morning in your side of the world. But um, there was the viewing of the cancel rim pack um, composition that was, was shared. And so RIMPAC represents the largest maritime exercise in the world that began since 1971, has occurred every two years, the most recent occurrence being 2020. But in 2018, it brought 25,000 military troops from 25 different countries, along with 47 surface ships, five submarines, and more than 200 aircraft for one military exercise. So in the video representation of protests with the cancel RIMPAC efforts, there was much reference to Moana and Moana Nui. That word may sound familiar because of the Disney cartoon Moana, but for us Moana Nui refers to the vast ocean that connects us across the Pacific. Um, and so um, as you can see, in the case of our island, our strategic location as this tiny piece of real estate, very valuable real estate uh, that has become commodified by the US military, um, is, is its strategic location makes it very, very prime real estate. And because of that, our colonization um, is because, has been the US's agenda for many, many uh, centuries now. And so if you look at the United States' um, movement, um, their recent U.S. Indo-Pacific security strategy, uh, not so different in terms of its goals from previous approaches of the Asia-Pacific pivot, for example. Clearly, with the intention of the containment of China, we see the fortification of bases throughout our region to include our island as well as Hawaii, um, extending to Australia, as well as the Philippines. And so I share a quote from a US captain, Robert Lee, who stated, we're seeing a realignment of forces away from Cold War theaters to Pacific theaters. And Guam is ideal because it is a US territory and therefore gives us maximum 
flexibility. I underscore the words maximum flexibility because essentially this, our island is one of the 16 remaining non-self-governing territories as recognized by the United Nations. And so there is nothing neo about our colonization. It is old school colonization that has, are the remnants of that process that really should have been rectified since the 1960s globally. And so because of our territorial status, the, the US is essentially has free reign because of our lack of political power as colonial subjects on the island. And so last year alone, the US has spent $365 million on the Marine Corps realignment projects, uh, many of which of these dollars have, dollars have been cost shared with uh, the government of Japan um, that is investing roughly $3 billion in the Guam military buildup. Most recently, as a matter of fact, in the, the news of today has been the indications of additional funding that's being sought to develop a standoff weapons complex that would have short range ballistic missiles as well as glide bombs carried by B-52s and B-1 and B-2 stealth bombers. And so you see this hyper militarization of our island that is only 212 square miles in space. So a very small, tiny little island that in many maps of the world, we are represented by literally a dot of which two, uh, one third of our landmass is occupied by the US um, Department of Defense. And so what is militarization meant for us in the Pacific? It's meant a lot of things. This picture on the far corner on the left is a child who's been burned by atomic testing. You see uh, massive amounts of military recruitment, largely because of the economic conscripts of the poverty that permeates our community. You see high levels of patriotism in our elders to the US, um, largely because of the war experience and the US returning to the island to quote unquote liberate the island, even though we know that there really is no freedom in a US territory or colony. You see remnants of the war experience and you see lots and lots of military activities that continue to, to um, define our island on a daily basis. And so if you look at a region within the Pacific in which Guahan is contained, we are part of the Mariana Island chain in Micronesia. And so I wanted particularly to share this slide because um, the, in the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, the two bombs, Fat Man and Little Boy, were carried by Enola Gay that originated from the tiny island in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands to the north of our island, which is called Tinian. And so this image here is a memorialization of where the bombs were kept and stored and assembled as it was transmitted and, and brought to facilitate the destruction of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And for this, I am you know, I apologize on behalf of our people for our complicity with the destruction that was done to the communities in Japan. And so the other big part of the nuclear story in the Pacific and most certainly in Micronesia is that of the Marshall Islands. And so this here is an image of the US Army Kwajalein Atoll Reagan test site. Uh, Kwajalein as, or Kwaj as it's often referred to, um, which essentially resulted in the development, the development of this base resulted in the um, removal of its indigenous peoples um, who were relocated to this tiny island of Ibai on this atoll, which has been considered to be one of the most crowded islands on earth uh, with a very thick population density of in the space of 0.14 square miles contains roughly 15,000 people. This island really, if you, if you visit, is as though it is a, 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 an entire slum of indigenous peoples who, who um, are forced to live in those conditions. And so this image here of the Bravo test that occurred on the Marshall Islands, um, which was America's first hydrogen bomb, clearly with this image, you know, it's, it's very stark and very st um, startling when you look at this right? The destruction that came with that. The fact, most people don't know the fact that for the Marshallese in which, who experienced this detonation, the ash fell from the sky for over three days with people thinking that it was snow and playing in this ash because they had never seen anything like it. Um, so the 
patients in terms of health outcomes. Um, in the course of time between 1946 and 1958, 67 nuclear bombs and Bikini and a third island that is me at the moment. So I wanted to share a few slides that I received from our colleague, our sister from the Marshall Islands, Ms. Abaca Anderson, and shares these, these images. She shares these of really what has become and is witness to the human radiation experience. Another example, Dr. Research around the, the, pe the Marshallese people who were exposed to the detonation and the impacts of the, um, the nuclear fallout. And so this is a man from Roman Lock examined. And this uh, Lisa, you're going, we cannot hear your voice. Now? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. No, I think it's okay. It? You're back. You're back. No. My Wi-Fi is is going in and out. My apologies. No worries. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. So this image is of a young man who is actually the son of a mayor who, basically, as a result of the exposure to the radiation. So there's our community because of the deaths, the unnecessary deaths. This is an image of a gentleman relatively immediately after to know and to understand the complexities of the impacts of these nuclear te uh, exposures. And so what we're seeing now is lots of birth defects to include autism. Um, and more recently, children being born without eyeballs and most recently, as reported by Ms. Abaca Anjan, um, with tails that need to be removed. Naturally, people were relocated. Greenpeace was very instrumental um, with the relocation of the people to different islands. And this is a plea from a woman who at eight years old was exposed to the nuclear bombing test and who longs to go back home to her island of Rongelap. Um, and hopes to be able to see that at some point before her death and to be buried in her homeland. But as we know, even though there's lots of persuasive, uh, manipulative ways of trying to lure them back home, it is clear that their islands are not safe. And um, for that reason, many have chosen not to go back. And so I wanted to share that this story of radiation exposure from the nuclear test clearly is one of the people of the Marshall Islands. However, as this slide indicates, is that the exposure of radiation extends considerably beyond the Marshall Islands. And so um, my island, my home island, for example, which is here, is still within this radiation fallout as a result of the downwinds, the winds that were brought through the wind patterns from the detonation sites to other islands. And so this slide shows the strontium 90 levels um, that were recorded in rainfall. Um, and you can see data in comparison of Guahan, my island, as well as the capital of the Marshalls, which is Majuro. And you can see that in most of these years, between 1968 and 1974, the levels of strontium 90 are higher in our island, which is quite a ways than from in Majuro because of the winds in which were brought to islands that are neighboring. And so as a result of that, you see these birth defects and these health problems exist as well in other places, such as in, in the Ponapean Islands. And so this US military legacy has left very ugly things for us in Micronesia, um, first of which is land dispossession, as is evidenced by uh, the people of uh, the island of Kwajalein who were relocated as well as our own island where one third of our land has been lost to the US military. Clearly radiation exposure that comes in many different packages and forms. It's not just from nuclear weapons. Uh, you have nuclear submarines, for example, and we've had spills of uh, uh, nuclear activity from those subs in our harbors that we're not told and informed as a community. And whenever you've got toxins in the environment, you're going to have poor health outcomes. And we see this through and through, it, particularly when we examine cancer uh, rates, for example, as well as um, there was a study that was done on cancer on our island. And 
And the data clearly evidences that in the villages where the, micro, where the military bases are housed in the north and the south are where you have the highest incidences of cancer on our island. In addition, there's the prohibition of our traditional practices as Native peoples, for example, access to fishing grounds, as well as access to the medicines that are part of our traditional medicines that we use to heal our bodies and to stay healthy. And ultimately is the deferment of our right to exercise our self-determination and our independence as a people, considering we are an unincorporated territory of the United States. And so we as women are very motivated by our protection of our future generations. This young girl here, uh, her name is Gwinaiza. It's a Chamorro word for the word love. And she embodies everything that's loving, you know? And so we are reminded and we put at the forefront of our minds and we work together across the globe, you know, with Hirano San and with other women throughout to protect the world, right? And to protect what it is that we have um, because we know that what's at stake for all of us really truly is our very survival. And thank you for the opportunity to share our story throughout Micronesia and the Pacific uh, with respect to um, disarmament. Thank you, Yam uh, Jere, Lisa, uh, Linda. This, this has been one of the most powerful testimonies I've ever seen in my life. And so do I think the members of International Peace Bureau will be, and friends who are watching from around the world, will be deeply moved by what we have shared. Um, this has been shocking. Um, the story of disarmament has always been stuck in London, New York, and Geneva, but your voice has clearly brought forth what is happening in so many of these areas of the world, which we hardly hear from. Uh, so I think, again, I'm looking at how do we get some of the ideas that we have learned from your really, really powerful, moving and painful presentation. One of the things, it is acceptable that we have jellyfish babies born with tails. This is not the world that we are trying for. This is not civilization as defined by the modern world. So I think one of the thing is as a part of the uh, you know, uh, declaration of the Asia Pacific women on in disarmament and demilitarization. We should include what is happening here, right? In Guam, Marshall Islands, what you have just shared and say no to environmental violence done to our children, done through this and no to ready testing on our indigenous lands and territories. We should bring this very, very clearly. And also this fact that one third of your territory is controlled by the military, you know, by the US military. Uh, the U.S. has a new government now, and there is a woman vice president. We should prevail upon such leaders. And I think all of us, you know, friends from Japan, from yourself, if you write to them, I think we can make change happen. I, have, I feel the power in your resilience, and I think we should turn a new leaf in our strategy towards advocacy to actually, as what Emiko said, to be in decision making so that we can stop this right here and right now, because this is unacceptable. 67 nuclear tests in islands, such as Marshall Island and yours is unacceptable. Also, I've heard also even in North America, so many indigenous sites used as dumping of nuclear waste in Navajo Island, Navajo territory and others. So this is unacceptable and we, we have to work very seriously on the next steps. Thank you once again, and with this, a call upon our last speaker, uh, Jungmin Choi, the coordinator of nonviolence training at the World Without War, a South Korean anti militarist organization based in Seoul, to deliver her words. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bina. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Jungmin Choi, um, and I work for a South Korean anti militarist group. Anti-militarist organization called the World Without War, 전쟁 없는 세상. Um, thank you for inviting me uh, to this uh, precious event tonight, and I'm happy to meet uh, my old friends here online. Hi, Lisa, Cora, and yeah, everybody. And um, I'm going to um, 
uh, introduce my group's activism. Um, there are a lot of uh, things World Without War did and does uh, to put it all in 15 minutes, but I will try to yeah, explain it in, in time. Okay, let me show you my um, slides. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so as the name of my organization, World Without War, uh, suggests the people who gather uh, in my group, including myself, are uh, those who dreamed of a world without war, of course, and um, strive to make it uh, possible. Um, um, well, of course, we believe anti-war movements such as the protests against the war in Iraq, where billions of people poured into the streets are necessary, but we also think it is important to address the causes of uh, in our uh, social structures and everyday life that make war possible. So the first thing we noticed was the draft system. Um, there are so many possible uh, causes of war in Korean society, but it is very serious uh, for most Korean men in their 20s to learn how to handle weapons in the military for 18 months and experience military hierarchies and obedience. Uh, the experience also greatly affects other members of society who have not experienced military service, such as women, in their daily lives. So we support conscientious objectors and inform others about the problems of the conscription system. Um, the, uh, our basic strategy of the campaign was civil, dis civil disobedience, uh, which means um, the publicly uh, break the law and go to jail. Uh, this is a picture of a conscientious objector carrying a piece of uh, notice of enlistment. Um, yeah, of course, he made an enlarged copy. Uh, originally, the notice isn't that big. Uh, although only five to 10 uh, conscientious objectors who uh, openly declare their conscience appeared in a, in a year, the impact of these um, minorities uh, was tremendous. Uh, it took less than 20 years for the Constitutional Court to decide that uh, the provisions of the current military service law, which did not stipulate an alternative service system for conscientious objectors, were inconsist inconsistent with the Constitution. Um, this was a press conference welcoming the Constitutional Court's decision. Yeah, well, everybody looks happy, right? Um, uh, the picket said uh, people has won, uh, conscientious objection is not a crime. After the decision of the Constitutional Court in 2018, all conscientious objectors who were imprisoned were released, and eventually the alternative service system was officially implemented in October uh, last year. Uh, if you recall how difficult it is for a social movement related to um, defense or security to succeed, this achievement is very meaningful. Uh, although the introduced system has a punitive nature that the service period is twice as long as the military service and that objectors must serve in correctional facilities only. Uh, Another success factor of the campaign is that the personal narrative of the objectors uh, minimize the negative response of such, a, such an uh, disruptive strategy of the campaign and make people feel sorry. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, about five to 10 people openly um, refused military service each year, but this number was not the total number of conscientious objectors in South Korea. The number of Jehovah's Witnesses who refused to serve in the military on a very personal and religious level reached about uh, 400 every year. Um, their stories are often so miserable that it is difficult to hear without tears, uh, particularly during the military dictatorship of the 70s and 80s, uh, repeated uh, beatings, torture, and deaths were constant. Because it was a conscription system, most Korean men knew it uh, as they saw or heard this brutality and thought it was too much, but there wasn't much they could do. 
some of male attorneys uh, defending objectors who were sentenced to imprisonment after a perfunctory uh, military trial decided to join the legal team for objectors. Even after objectors were released, some of them died from the after effect of beatings or suffered from um, claustrophobia and panic disorder. Uh, thus, in early days of the conscientious objection movement, the campaign focused on discovering cases of such serious repression uh, with historians, uh, holding uh, historical uh, exhibitions, and organizing collective testimony of objectors and their families. Um, the paintings you just saw are sketches of the uh, state, statement of conscientious objectors and their families and displayed at the historical exhibition. Yeah, this is the exhibition. This is a photo of an activist uh, explaining the history of a conscientious objection to the student who came to the exhibition. Uh, and as uh, the organization grew and became more uh, stabilized, we thought that it would be possible to start a second campaign, which would be to monitor the arms trade and organize against them. Uh, in addition to the fact that the organization was able to afford this uh, second campaign, there were several discussions about the organization's first campaign, the, the conscientious objection campaign. Among them, there was concern that the tactic of cons conscientious objection is an action that can only be done by men who received uh, a notice of military duty in Korean society. So naturally, men object male objectors uh, were made innocent victims or adventurous heroes and women activists who worked together with the objectors against militarism in South Korea and all over the world, portrayed as tearful supporters. So there was a need for a campaign to work with others who could not object to military service. So we started the second campaign in 2009. Currently, this work is engaged in activities to resist the exportation, uh, exportation of police weapons such as tear gas and water cannons, in, a, in addition to organizing against arms fairs such as ADEX and DX Korea, which are representative of uh, markets that deal arms in South Korea. Um, yeah, in modern society, the arms fair has functioned as a market for buying and selling cutting edge weapons. Uh, there are around 100 arms fairs around the world and about 30 of them are larger in scale and more established. Yeah, the ADEX Expo in, in South Korea, which occurs in old years, um, is among the 30, 30 larger arms fairs. Um, ADEX uh, primarily, primarily showcases Air Force uh, weapons and um, DX Korea um, it specializes in arms weapons uh, that held on even numbered years. Uh, DX Korea is smaller in scale, but it's important to keep in mind that the companies who uh, manufacture weapons such as tear gas, uh, water cannons, primarily used against protesters attend this expo. For example, Teji PNI uh, is a company that uh, produces water cannons and armored vehicles that have been exported to Indonesia and have been used against the people of West Papua uh, involved in the independence movement against the colonial occupation of Indonesia. And South Korea uh, decided to hold another expo that displays and sells police uh, weapons only, uh, perhaps uh, because DX Korea alone was not enough uh, for South Korean government. Uh, since two years ago, South Korea has hosted the Korea Police World Expo, the only security industry fair in East Asia. Yeah, this, uh, the, the, uh, this is from the CIPRI um, yearbook. Uh, yeah, and South Korea is about tense in terms of global weapons importer and exporter. Uh, the country buys mostly from the United States. Um, the division of North and South Korea and military conflict between them have long been the excuse for, uh, for arming. Uh, difficulty in the economy has been an ex excuse for arms export. And discourse of uh, leftist nationalism uh, about achieving the nation's self-defense 
capabilities uh, has also been an excuse for increasing military expenditure. Uh, also, for some time, the South Korean government has actively promoted uh, transnationally exporting weapons to uh, defense contractors. As a result, Korean-made weapons are being witnessed in um, conflict areas and human rights violations around the world. Uh, for example, since uh, 2015, Yemen has experienced some of the worst humanitarian crises in history. The perpetrators of war can be directly traced to the use of Korean-made fragmentary grenades and anti-tank guided missiles, which have been used against people and air raids. Uh, this was revealed in footage gathered on social media platforms and uh, media networks such as YouTube. And additionally, in the Ad Azerbaijan-Armenian war, uh, which began in September last year, it was reported that the anti-tank guided weapon, Hyongung, used in the war was developed by uh, LIGNX1 and Hanhua. Uh, these are all Korean companies. Let me tell you a little more about the campaign against the export of Korean uh, police uh, weapons. Uh, in South Korea, tear gas can no longer be used against uh, civilians and protesters. And yet, Korea has been producing and exporting tear gas. Uh, uh, yeah, tear gas. At first, we didn't know about this. But then in uh, 2013, I received an email telling me that uh, Korean-made tear gas was being used to suppress protesters involved in the democratization movement in Bahrain. World Without War took this issue seriously and immediately began spreading awareness about the issue. Uh, our goal was to inform the South Korean public and uh, pre pressure the government to halt its export. Uh, in wanting to sustain the campaign with sudden beginnings, uh, we raised funds and invited Varain uh, Watch activists to share their testimonies, among other uh, various activities, to maximize exposure across media platforms. Then in um, 2014, exports of South Korean tear gas were tentatively sus uh, suspended after killing 39 people and gaining uh, international criticism. In fact, for us, it was an unexpected thrilling victory. Uh, we received an email from Bahraini activists in October 2013 and exports were temporarily, temporarily uh, suspended by January 2014. Um, in the history of World Without Wars activism, our primary goal had never been achieved in such a short amount of time. Uh, it's important, so I think it's important to note that there were several factors to the campaign success. Um, First, South Koreans identified with the toils of democratization and were uh, sympathetic to the situation in Bahrain. Uh, this photo was taken shortly after Lee han -yeol, a college student who participated in the demonstration, was hit by the tear gas. Uh, this incident triggered the June Democratic Uprising of 1987. Uh, through this uprising, the direct, uh, direct presidential election system was implemented in South Korea and institutional democratization began to take root uh, in Korean society. And um, this case was made into a movie in 2017, but in case if somebody <laughs> watched this film. Um, second, there was a whistleblower. Um, the major tear gas manufacturer claimed it was a scam by a company that lost the export competition. But anyway, uh, the informant uh, report enabled us to launch the campaign very quickly. Lastly, there was international solidarity, of course. Um, after this successful campaign, we launched another campaign to uh, revise the current in, uh, national law that allows tear gas to be exported, despite there is a clear evidence of human rights violations. Uh, because it would be very difficult to organize campaigns each time uh, tear gas was exported, uh, we worked to, we worked, worked to uh, change the law. Uh, simultaneously, we did take action against the exportation of tear gas to Turkey as well, because the bloody South Korean tear gas appeared in Turkey's uh, protest and uh, pride marches as well. Um, 
through our orga organizing, we were able to halt uh, Korea's exportation of uh, tear gas to Turkey in 2016. However, uh, Korean tear gas has not disappeared from the streets of Turkey. This is because CNOTEC, a South Korean tear gas producer concerned with social criticism. So they established a local factory in Turkey and started to produce tear gas on site to bypass critic and the law. So thus, um, it is now responsibility of the Turkish movement to drive South Korean tear gas off the street of Turkey. Um, also, uh, World Without War has launched a campaign to um, stop exporting water cannons to Thailand and Indonesia from last year. Um, and a few days ago, we heard the news that there was a media report uh, that the DK-44 tear gas grenades used in Myanmar's dem uh, democratization protests were believed to have been produced by the South Korean company, uh, Daegwon Chemical Industry. Yeah, it's going on. Yeah, although social movements are making uh, lots of efforts to create a peaceful world, the greed of the state and um, capital uh, for profit are terrifying. Uh, there have been uh, times when I, been uh, pessimistic uh, about our future, but then I try to remember that hope uh, comes through and will come from activism. Yeah, I spoke for a while, so I think this should be done. Um, thank you for having me today again, and thank you for paying attention to our activism. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jungmin Joy. This is again a very informative uh, to know, um, uh, you know that. Uh, just a word yesterday, the I think the Freedom House report came out on the state of world's democracy. And my country, India, has been demoted from a free country to a partially free country. And you mentioned about tear gas, you know, water cannons, which are used repeatedly on protesters, men, women, and children. And as we know, in Myanmar, more than uh, 38 people died past couple of days. Uh, we IPB had a meeting, emergency meeting on that and took out a statement. But what you have shared very clearly in your presentation is how the uh, the unregulated arms trade uh, has resulted in human rights violations and, and the worsening of democracies in our parts of the world and how your work uh, and your team's work on World Without War has actually succeeded, as you said, in trying to push forward uh, that we are holding our governments responsible to see that our weapons are not used to hurt, harm, or kill the lives of many others around the world as our countries benefit from the, uh, the, the, this arms trade. So I think, thank you so much for bringing the element. Emiko spoke on nuclear weapons, and I think you have really uh, spoken on the issue of an unregulated arms trade. We do have an international arms trade treaty. And I was personally part of it as a negotiator together with many other civil society organizations in the world. But like many, many international disarmament treaties, it is just remaining on paper. And it requires people like yourselves and all the panelists here and together with support of others to make what we call making disarmament meaningful to the lives of our children, of our young people, of our land, our resource and our generation. So thank you so much. With this, uh, I would like to uh, you see if Stephanie or Sean, are there any questions from the floor as we try to turn to the next part of this really excellent presentations from each of our speakers, uh, which has really set the tone for what we want to do, uh, the strategy. So um, as if there are uh, you know, people who want to ask questions, I think the chat is open. Uh, how do we want to do about it? So as we do this, I'm going to um, ask our moderators to think about, uh, based on the really important work that you all have done, and I will start with our first speaker. Uh, and of course, you've spoken about the work on how did gender and disarmament, how did you start working on this? What was your motivation? And what is your message to the younger generation? How do we carry on this work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and then, yeah, so this is one question. And the other question is, how do we strategize to make it happen? 
and your <laughs> vision and how do we coordinate to have a Asia Pacific Women's Declaration on Disarmament and Demilitarization. So I'll start with Emiko and then Lisa, Linda and okay. Jungmin. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Li uh, Lisa and Jungmin for, for your wonderful, um, I mean, a very informative and, and uh, informative presentations. And there were so many things that I didn't know about. And also I just want to add to Lisa, Linda, the present presentation that uh, you talked about bikini atoll uh, hydrogen bomb test in bikini atoll. And in that uh, testing, uh, there are many, many Japanese fi fishing boats uh, were exposed, crewmen were exposed to radiation from that tests. And so uh, actually uh, the anti-nuclear movement uh, in Japan started, I mean, uh, it, it it had been there. Our movement had been there, but but the movement uh, took the moment uh, momentum of the people's anger uh, against the third use of the th uh, third um, third suffering of Japanese uh, people uh, but caused by the atomic bombing and hydrogen bombs. So we commemorate the March the first, the day of the uh, uh, expo explosion, uh, and we. Every year we commemorate the beginning as beginning day. And we have just finished the, this year's uh, event, although we had to do it uh, online. And uh, answering to the question from Bina, uh, I as I as stated in my bio, uh, I in started engaged in a peace movement uh, at a, uh, when I was, was the university student and when I um, first heard directly the stories of Hibakusha. But then shortly after that, I became aware of the uh, women's suffering uh, uh, in Asian countries uh, during the um, war of aggression uh, waged by Japan and the problem of the so-called so comfort women, the uh, survivors and victims of the uh, sexual slavery by the Japanese military. So uh, I, I think it was around uh, 1992 or so, because it was 1991 when the harmony of South Korea, uh, Kim Hakson mm -hmm. first ca uh, came forward to speak about her uh, damage, the damage she suffered uh, um, it, uh, by the, suffered by the, caused by the Japanese military. And then I was so shocked that how the war and the discrimination against women uh, exploit, exploited uh, Asia, our Asian neighbors. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just, I was horrified and terrified to know that women at the age of like uh, 10 or 12 uh, were forced into sexual slavery. So, uh, and I, I think it was at that time that I became, I became aware of the, the relationship between gender and war or sexual exploitation and war. So that was the, ta that was the time, uh, that was the one thing and made one thing that I, that took me into, that brought me into the movement more deeply into the peace movement. And my message to the younger generation is that uh, please uh, look for uh, as many opportunities as possible to hear the stories of the survivors and, and not only from the wars in the past, but also uh, the war conflict uh, which is going on. And because we have social media and we have more opportunities than before to know the facts and so, and also please go to, uh, go look for the uh, spaces where you can share your own stories with others. And then please uh, try to um, have conversations with the, uh, those uh, with the experience like me and, and Lisa and Jumin and all others, and also like Cola. <laughs> Thank you okay, so much. We have such, a rich resource and inspiration from intergenerational learning. And you're absolutely right. How can we 
uh, except 10, 11 year old, many of us are mothers, we have children and how can we say how our girl child have been exploited? And as uh, it was said, you see patriarchy, patriarchy, racism, uh, militarization, capitalism and colonization. These are the structures and superstructure which has kept right from the gendered aspect to the 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 the, the fueling of indigenous territories to what is happening which has been uh, really really important so we have to keep that in mind all the time so with this again uh, lisa linda again your work and your testimony one of the most powerful i've ever heard in my life what what is the strength that comes when you have done this work and and again um, how do we continue that the important work is shared and then how do we connect uh, to be able uh, to, as you said, that uh, women from Guan territory has been going to the United Nations. Has it really worked? And why <laughs> hasn't it worked? And how can we change that? <laughs> Thank you for those questions. And, you know, um, it's, as I said in the beginning, I mean, it is so beautiful to share this space, albeit electronic, very different kind of an experience than we normally have, right, Emiko or Jungmin when we're together, uh, as well as our Tita Kora, who's our, you know, in so many ways, our mentor, right, in, in this kind of work. Um, I think, you know, for me personally, um, coming into this work really came as a responsibility, you know, and I, you know, when we bring a delegation from Guahan to a conference in Japan and we sit across the table, it's very contrastingly different. The Japanese side, and Emiko is nodding her head, the Japanese side is typically men that are much older and the Guahan side is typically women who are much younger. So they often will ask us, how did you get the young to, to be involved? What are you doing? How are you engaging the younger generation? And the truth of the matter is one of the tragedies, honestly, of colonizing, of American colonization, not that I think it's any different than anybody else's form of colonization, is that we are raised with very little information about ourselves, our own history, our own uh, the historical development. I was at dinner tonight with Auntie Hope, who's our Sina in that picture, and she was sharing how she had interviewed the last naval government of Guam um, on his visit to the island, he was already in a wheelchair, he was in his 90s, the last naval governor before we had a civilian government. And he specifically admitted that when the United Nations was establishing the list of non-self-governing territories, that he specifically as the governor withheld that entire process from the local community. Right, that's part of the disempowerment. That's part of control, right? So we learn the 50 states of the United States as school children. We don't even know our neighboring countries in the Pacific, you know? And that is the perfect example of how our whole entire life experience is co-opted, right? And so part of education and many of us who have moved into activism went away for school in the US which forces you to reflect on who you are, right? And as indigenous peoples, we have such a unique experience because most of us are significant minorities no matter where we end up, right? And so that process of reflection, you know, and when you look at the history of oppression, there is a tremendous responsibility when you return home. And the, the, the piece that I think that is really important to share as well is that in our traditional beliefs as Pacific Islanders, we are just the current, you know, generation of a long lineage of people that have come before us and of our children that are yet to be born. So for us, we have a responsibility and are guided by our ancestors and we have a responsibility to the generations to come. And we take that very seriously. But just to share two last points, because I know I'm going on and on. But one is that, um, we are so grateful to the larger peace movement because Guahan was absent in the peace movement up until the announcement of the relocation of a Marine base from Okinawa to Guahan in 2006. We weren't a part of the landscape at all, but the peace movement 
largely facilitated by Japanese co-activists said, you know what, we need to hear from you folks. What do you folks want? And they really did an amazing job of bringing us into the fold, teaching us, mentoring us. And we caught up in terms of understanding how we're a very critical piece of this large global story. You know, and so that kind of solidarity really can transform a whole community. You know, um, so when we get invitations from Guahan, oftentimes it comes to my, e my inbox and I keep rotating our youth into those slots so that we can learn that this is a huge movement and what we've been programmed to believe in terms of militarism, creating safety, creating economic prosperity, all of that, that it's, there's no truth, that it's not based in truth. And so for us, it's, it's based, you know, it comes from that responsibility and an obligation to our ancestors and to the generations to come. Yes. Thank you so much, Lisa Linda. I think that's why the upcoming International Peace Bureau, um, in, uh, the International Peace Congress about reimagining the world, uh, action for peace, this is really, really important. So all of, of you tuning in, please participate. And I think, uh, you know, Lisa, Linda, and many others are going to be speaking once again and carrying our voice. This is absolutely right. International Peace Bureau, again, as I repeat, the world's oldest peace organization uh, with amazing uh, historical background of peace building, women led peace building, you know, community led peace building. I think this is how, and with labor movements joining in, with Philip, which is one of our co presidents, I mean, a lot of real energy has been generated. And as we saw the action done by the labor movement in the Myanmar crisis, where they've really come about to support. So I think there's an intergeneration, intersectional movement is, is the need of the hour. I also myself come from Manipur, which is again, a, a part of India, which is actually colonized by India. We have a martial law there since 1958. Uh, we are indigenous community there. And just like, as you said, Lisa Linda, our history is not in the textbooks of India. <laughs> We have been completely sidelined and we don't know our neighbors, but we are all connected to New Delhi. <laughs> we are all connected to Washington DC. We're all connected to Geneva, but we are not connected with one another. So I think that's the power of what I'm hearing today is the cross intersection of nations, communities uh, to be able uh, to put our right thing. Uh, Jungmin, again, your voice has really brought about um, the youth, uh, the, the, the kind of innovative ways Again, really uh, practical ways of conscientious objectors, as you say, and uh, I think there are also vortex resistors I have met uh, in, in, in North America, the vortex resistors, friends who are imprisoned um, because they refuse to pay the, the tax to the US government because for every $1 of tax that you pay as an American to the American government, 55 cents goes to the military industry. So some Americans have refused to pay the taxes, including many doctors, and they have been jailed in today's times. And I've also seen extraordinary group of people who have really protesting against many of these uh, injustice and about the wrong way in which America has said. So I think there's a lot of work that has been done. I can see the hand of Jun Kyu raising, but I think uh, uh, Jung, Jung Min, uh, you and Junkyu can have a dialogue because both of you and Junkyu is our board member uh, of International Peace Bureau. So I'll give the floor to you, Jungmin, and then Junkyu, you can you can take on from there. Uh, thank you, Bina. And well, <laughs> yes, I yeah well. Well, uh, my group is really small. And um, the, at, at first, when we start our campaign and we we didn't think we can succeed any of our um, topics, like um, the against conscription system, against um, arms trade, and it's just huge for us. It's just like Goliath and yeah, it's uh, throwing an uh, uh, X to the to the really rock, the uh, big rock kind of thing. So um, we thought that the um, we need some like very disruptive actions, so we can be exposed to the public or uh, the social injustice 
social injustices just under the uh, surface is uh, ex uh, exposed to the public and uh, we need to sacrifice our uh, personal sacrifice so that we we are not just seen uh, from the public that they are just uh, very naughty uh, young people they just they just um, love to uh, make noises and yeah, chaos in the public or something like that. So uh, that's our um, major tactics, major uh, strategies uh, for our campaign. Uh, I think it works. And yeah, <laughs> and as we deal with the uh, conscription system and we have many young people approach it, uh, reach it out to us uh, because they want to know how to avoid <laughs> conscription system because in, in, in Korea, well, uh, every other countries, the young people, they never want to uh, uh, join the army. So um, yeah, it's uh, relatively easy to contact with young people. Uh, and there is a chance to uh, discuss about, uh, with them about the militarism, yeah, and so on. Mm. Yeah, Thank this you. is it. And how about Jungkyu? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, in fact, in fact, I'm a former soldier. Yeah, I'm a former soldier. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a Korean, yeah, Korean man. Yeah, yeah so yeah, so I have a uh, one comment and uh, uh, one question. It's uh, the first three uh, in 2017 yeah, under the Korean Peninsula Crisis, yeah, the North Korea North Korea uh, Kim Jong Un um, chairman chairman Kim Jong Un yeah, declared declared attack. Uh, Attacking in Guam, yeah, attacking the military base, the U.S. military bases in Guam, yeah, yeah. Um, as the response to the U.S. threatening to North Korea. I remembered, I remembered my friends in Guam. Yeah, I met in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, yeah, and whenever the U.S. Uh, bombers fly to the Korean Peninsula, they come to the Korean Peninsula from. Mm, the U.S. military bases in Guam. Yeah, I think yeah, our movements, our movements closely connected each other. Yeah, I think, I think so. And uh, the secondary, yeah, my question is uh, maybe yeah, yeah, basically related to uh, the uh, Japan's movement. It, it, mm, related to uh, Hirano Emiko. Yeah. However, uh, yeah, maybe um, related to Bina, yeah, it's a uh, because my question is uh, uh, international law problem. It's a uh, um, it's a uh, in January this year. In January this year, South Korean court South Korean court ruled against uh, the principle of sovereign sovereign immunity sovereign immunity. Yeah, so in a lawsuit filed by uh, the victims and, and the survivors of uh, the wartime sexual slave. It's, uh, as you know, as you know, sovereign immunity means the sovereign state cannot be subjected to the juris jurisdiction of another uh, country. Yeah, it's a, uh, but South Korean, South Korean, uh, South Korean court ruled that a sovereign immunity doesn't apply to crimes against humanity. And that means the exemption of sovereign immunity. Is, uh, of course, the Japanese government official position is uh, uh, the ruling, the judgment, the, the judgment is the violation of international law. Yeah. The, the Japanese government in the, the official uh, position. So um, my question is, what do you think about that uh, that uh, judgment uh, 
uh, is, uh, particularly the, for the Japanese uh, women's movement, uh, you are you 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 uh, ha uh, have have been have been in, in doing solidarity with the uh, uh, South Korean women's, women's uh, uh, movement uh, for a long time. So, and uh, what do you think about the uh, the viewpoint of uh, uh, international law is in particularly uh, international human, humanitarian law. Yes. yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Jin Q. Again, really good questions. I, I can see two questions. One, Jessica Pardo has also asked uh, a question before this. So uh, I don't know if Lisa Linda, can you see the chat with her question? So that's one. Number two is uh, the question that Junki has raised is a very pertinent question. Uh, what I do remember is when it comes to uh, sexual violence, states are always saying, you know, uh, uh, that um, it's, it's, for example, if any sexual violence committed against uh, by Indian soldiers in our indigenous territories, we cannot go to courts of law protected by the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, for example. Um, and then, for example, diplomats are immune, are immune from anything. If they even commit any crime, they're immune. But what the United Nations did in 18, uh, United Nations Security Council Resolution 1820, which has declared rape as a war crime, sexual assault as a war crime. So for us is peace movement, anyone who does any sexual violence, violence against humanity, particularly crimes against women and girls, under this 1820, I think we do can and hold our government and any government who has committed, so many UN peacekeeping troops have also committed sexual violence and crime. So I think that we have, we do have mechanisms uh, out there for indigenous people, it is not there yet. So we are also trying to find our indigenous form of justice for the sexual crimes committed on indigenous territories. It's still not there under international law. So this is my assessment, but with this, uh, I will call upon um, uh, Emiko and Lisa Linda to, uh, to comment on Junki's question. And I just want to be mindful of time. If anyone has any question, uh, we have uh, uh, like, we will be ending at sharp in a couple of minutes, 13 minutes to be precise. So please respond in like two minutes each. Okay. Um, uh, as thank you, uh, Junki san for raising this question because it's, this is very important because uh, the Japanese government has never, uh, never, Taken any uh, effective measures uh, to uh, to uh, how do you say uh, to recover recover to recover the damage caused caused by the Jap past Japanese military against uh, against women in Asia, including Korea, uh, for their suffering from the uh, sexual slavery, and the Japanese government always say said th their position is that the uh, issue has been settled by the treatment agreement between the two countries, Korea and Japan. But the uh, international, as, uh, as Bina says, United Nations and also many, many uh, treaty bodies, uh, including the uh, Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, has issued uh, recommendations uh, to Japanese government uh, repeatedly that Japan should uh, should hear the voices of, of uh, survivors and victims and try to find try to work, work things out uh, in accordance with what the survivors want. So, but the Jap so although the Japanese government. Uh, continues to claim that uh, they don't have any uh, obligation to uh, to respond to the uh, recommend recommendations from CEDO and other treaty bodies because the recommendations are not binding have are not binding. So, but we here in Japan, uh, many Japanese women's organizations and the women women's movement are supportive of the uh, uh, of the survivors and victims victims because this is not a problem of the past but uh, if we allow 
the uh, allow the, the position of the Japanese government, then the we will uh, we may commit the same mistake again to let our government or let the military uh, uh, commit uh, commit uh, sexual slavery and commit commit crimes against humanity against other countries. So uh, our position is to uh, urge and press our government to listen and, and respond uh, fully to the, all the recommendations uh, from the international, uh, in, in international organizations, including treaty bodies. And in terms of, uh, rega regarding the uh, decision from the sole, uh, lo sole uh, local, uh, no, 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 a so so called uh, we we fully agree with the view of the uh, human rights uh, uh, or or humanitarian experts and lawyers who who say that there is uh, the the sovereign so called so called sovereign immunity does not apply to the uh, to the uh, human crime against humanity including the heinous uh, crimes such as uh, sexual slavery. So, uh, Emiko? Okay, uh, this is my okay. answer. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. it. We, we have another question, but I think, uh, Liz and Linda, you had a question. If you can comment on it, we have nine more minutes before we close. So, uh, just a minute. And then Aisa, uh, uh, Aisa Khan, which is a board member from Mongolia, wants to make a brief comment too. So Lisa, Linda, and then Einstein. Okay. So with response to um, the question on the chat from Jessica Pardo, um, with regards to the preservation of our culture, we actually are very actively engaged in that. Um, through the UN framework, we utilize the United Nations uh, Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues that we've been connected with um, to elevate these issues, even in terms of militarization. And we have a myriad of programs uh, locally that we've been developing, especially for the protection of our traditional language. Um, our women's organization has a new project that we're embarking on um, where we're doing micro lending for women who are engaged in traditional livelihood practices. Um, and so we're, we're really vibrantly responding to that um, because of the threat of loss of culture because of the, the colonization. And then transitioning over to the question from Jun Q with regards to the North Korea threats, right, the DPRK threats uh, to attack of the island of Guahan. There's a couple of really key points. And I've actually been on the delegation uh, with Women Cross DMZ that was led by um, Gloria Steinem, Christine Ahn and others. And um, one thing that I think needs to be very clear is that the threat of the strike would only happen if the US had first preemptively striked. Right? So there was never a threat that they would strike first. And I think that's an important delineation. Number two, the fact that the reason why our island is the place of the threat is because the B-2 stealth bombers that would be used to attack North Korea would come from Anderson Air Force Base that is on our island. This is something we have no control over. But I'll tell you what, do you know what it feels like to wake up to the newspaper headline? 14 minutes. That's how long it would take for a nuclear weapon that's detonated from the DPRK to reach Guam. That's all the time that we would take. So we went, the island went into major panic in terms of, you know, and very ignorantly so, just so you know, in terms of how to prepare for a nuclear disaster. And we know the realities because of the experience in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, particularly with fire falling from the sky. But the, the, what we were informed as a community was just ridiculous. But what it really did was it elevated the conversational piece about raise the question of how secure does the US's military presence make us, right? Because even with their missile defense system that is very ineffective in shooting those bombs down, you know, diplomacy is what we've always put at the forefront in terms of achieving peace. Thank, thank you, Lisa Linda, once again. Aisa Khan, you have two minutes, and then I will, uh, uh, you know, conclude our really, really amazing session. In a well, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. The main uh, reason that I uh, want to say a few words is just to thank our three uh, presenters, Emiko, Lisa, and Jungmin, for their very, I would say, uh, uh, informative, eye-opening, and even invaluable uh, contributions uh, presentation. I think it was very good. Though I thought that you know, I as an Asian, you know, I know more or less about the uh, situation in the region, but I think the presentations were very, very uh, useful, even for Asians like myself. Uh, uh, with uh, uh, regard to Emika, I have two questions. I don't know if you will, you will have time to answer or not, but I want to let you know. First is that uh, since uh, I, uh, I was a student, uh, I knew about uh, the uh, uh, Japanese uh, constitutions, Article 9. I know that Article 9, you know, uh, uh, makes sure that uh, uh, Japanese uh, foreign policy and defense policy is defensive in, in that sense. But uh, now, as I understand, there are uh, some talks that uh, you have a legislation that goes beyond the nature or the spirit of Article 9. And I would like to know what is being done by the uh, peace movements, by NGOs, in this sense, uh, the, the, I, that's, that's very uh, one question. Another question is: Yeah, you said that, uh, Emika, you said that uh, sixteen and a half million uh, signs have been uh, signatures have been presented to the United Nations, uh, 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 talking uh, demanding the ending of nuclear weapons. I was like, I would like to know what. Uh, do you expect uh, the United Nations to do that? They accept, of course, with gratitude, but uh, do, do they uh, take any measures uh, following up on this or not? Isakal, uh, we, yes. we have to conclude in two minutes. So okay. can you okay. <laughs> okay. wrap up? Okay. Uh, Lisa, I have also uh, uh, two, two questions. First, I know that uh, there are 17 uh, non-self-governing uh, territories. I've heard and read uh, about Micronesia, Northern Mariana Islands, and Marshall Islands, and so on and so forth. And uh, as I understand, uh, some of the islands have signed, uh, as they say, compact of free association you know, with, with the United States. Does that allow the United States to have, let's say, not, new, uh, not uh, military bases, but uh, military bases that uh, have uh, nuclear related activities. As you have said, I think the bombers beat uh, too, you know, they uh, can uh, use nuclear weapons in that sense. So what do you do in, in that sense? Uh, 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 because uh, I know that uh, uh, the peoples uh, of those islands have, you know, allergies to nuclear issues. So is there anything that is being done in that sense? Uh, Thank you very much, Lisa. The questions are all noted. Since mm -hmm. we have only two minutes to go, what we can do is we can get Isaacan to get in touch with our speakers because in two minutes we have to conclude and close. So if this okay. okay with all the guests, I mean, and IPB office can. So first of all, uh, thank you for your questions and thank you to all the eminent speakers uh, and also to our really amazing Asia team, Cora, Raiko, Junkyu, Isaacan, and all of you, and also to the IPB Berlin office, uh, a really round of applause for Stephanie, for Sean, uh, for, for Reiner, for all, and of course, Lisa, for her opening remarks, reminding us once again, the importance of IPB's journey. And once again, to all of us to come back together for the uh, you know, Barcelona Congress. I would like to just uh, thank everyone there and all the panelists and all the people who have tuned in from around the world today for waking up so early, for staying up so late to be here with us. I will conclude by saying that the Asia Pacific uh, women and uh, men and people of all gender who have met today, we deliberated on the issue of gender of disarmament to mark International Women's Day. We recognize the militarization of our lives and we will ensure that the $1.9 trillion is used for peace and gender justice and not continue a world of war. We, the women, stand against strong against militarization and environmental violence that is done on our bodies, our land, our indigenous territories. We will create disarmament stories inspired by Hibakushas. 
and also by the stories from South, South uh, Korea. We recognize the violence done on indigenous territories, the radiation, the toxic waste and everything, cancel RIMPAC, cancel war, the culture of war, and the arms industry, stopping the international arms trade, and women of all people and gender to be a part of this process, education to remain critical, intergenerational, intersectional. Thank you all for your attention and uh, happy International Women's Day. And thank you all for your participation and we will carry on this work with strength. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Bina. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye.